Hello, and um, it's good to be here. Uh, thank you very much uh, to Vistur Selminch and also the Riga uh, City Architects Office for the invitation. Uh, and I will start with a few words about um, our studio. Uh, it's founded in 2007 by uh, Wolfgang Chapeller in Vienna, Austria, where we share close ties with um, the Academy Contemporary Culture and Technology. And we feel very privileged uh, to be able to work on exceptional projects uh, all, all across the world um, and to continue uh, staying true to our ethos, which is um, the ongoing inquiry in the, in, into the unforeseen. By that, with other words, um, we try to stay away from the generic uh, as far as possible. So in recent years, the majority of, of our work uh, is done abroad, and we enjoy this dynamic very much. And so today, I'm going to show you three episodes, uh, three universities that are not built yet, meaning uh, they have the right ingredient uh, to become the universities of the future. Episode one takes place in Vienna, episode two in Belgrade, Serbia, and episode three across the Atlantic uh, in upstate New York. And we start um, with the University of Applied Arts in Vienna. Uh, the location uh, is in central uh, Ringstrasse, in central Vienna, which would be equivalent to university, central university building of uh, University of Latvia here on the boulevard. And the, the idea of the university and the state property management agency was very smart. Uh, they wanted to free up all their really valuable buildings in the central Vienna, renovate them, rent them or sell them, and concentrate, bring all 17 departments to one uh, central campus location, which would have both economic and, as we found out, uh, spatial benefits. So that's how... Uh, the growing uh, campus, the vertical campus, was conceived. Because the site, uh, the historical site, was so limited, the campus could not expand outwards. It had to grow vertically. The, this block contains a series of different buildings uh, from different times and different authors. Uh, three of them are listed. And... Uh, uh, some of them belong to the University of Applied Arts and some to the Museum of Applied Arts, the MAC. And you find in these images, and I think this is very relevant also for Riga, that um, uh, the, the main building of the campus, uh, finished in 1965, is a reinforced concrete uh, building, and we have quite a lot of them here in Riga, some prominent ones the press norms and the Lauxheim Natives Ministry, but uh, I know for sure that uh, university, uh, technical university has quite a lot of those buildings as well. Um, and we started very carefully with looking at this block and seeing what are the qualities of this block. How can we improve the way this block functions? So we tried to remove some things that we thought were blocking uh, access to it and blocking the reading of these uh, buildings as individual um, volumes. So the first approach is to erase uh, some parts and restore uh, those that were uh, covered before. We proposed to then introduce an open circulation in this block which uh, somehow hints at possible collaboration with the museum the intensity between the university and the museum. But the main question remained, how to get the, all the extra square meters? So here is a, an attempt to, to do it by dislocating the circulation of the building, throwing it on the outside. This was an incredibly uh, efficient move. It allowed to increase the area of the building by one third. Then we added even another story on top of it. And it meant that this uh, serial structure, which just contains columns and slabs, can be fully flexible and fully uh, embraced by the different studios. And then the main uh, move, the main move how to activate those 
studios on different slabs was by introduction of a diagonal staircase, which we call the Broadway, connecting all the studios together and becoming uh, an essential link to enable interaction between them. Um, and at the bottom, uh, this is in fact underground, um, an interior uh, square, which would contain um, seven different lecture halls, which now can be shared more efficiently between all the departments. And it would all be covered by an open um, uh, garden. So here I'm quickly showing you uh, how the structure works. We erase the cores from the inside and bring them to the outside. We introduce the diagonal staircase, the Broadway. And together with the uh, two uh, circulation towers, uh, these constitute the new atrium, which is covered by an extremely light uh, tensile membrane. And the creation of the atrium suddenly allowed for new possibilities and therefore new uh, spaces were able to move into it. Project rooms, meeting rooms, collaborative spaces, reinforcing the possibility for cross-disciplinary projects. And we also proposed uh, something quite provocative. These are uh, some temporary structures on the roof, which can be uh, signals uh, when something takes place at the campus degree show. Uh, they can act as flags uh, on top of the building. So that way, the vertical campus was brought to life above ground. And it was then uh, when the project truly became uh, a contemporary university building, because suddenly, uh, all the knowledge was being linked instead of staying isolated. This is the underground level, which suddenly you see no boundary between uh, the, the hundred, more than 100 years old building on the uh, left-hand side and the modernist structure on the right-hand side. And above, again, it's all uh, covered with this uh, open garden. And the cross-section, I think, explains the best that suddenly the public space from the street uh, extends deep into the university campus and then vertically through it. Energy and climate, extremely important for uh, calculating the running costs, the maintenance costs of the university, uh, and it's an integral part of the planning process. So we really uh, also thought how the, this exterior space uh, would be a buffer zone, a winter garden that could really improve the, the current conditions of the building. Uh, all of it, uh, the entire structure, the facade, was supported by the existing uh, structure, only reinforcing it at critical points. It was tested through a series of physical models uh, and then um, converted to digital models tested by engineers and uh, brought together, with always focus on transparency, connectivity, and circulation as the public space, not just of the university, but of the entire city that surrounds it. Here you can see a fragment of a, a meeting room uh, on top of the Broadway, and here you can see the underground space uh, with the existing structure on the left-hand side. And both uh, formal and formal um, interaction can take place. You can imagine if a lecture suddenly takes place, uh, others can observe, decide whether to join in or, or participate or debate. And in my opinion, uh, the cities uh, become truly exceptional when they become dense. And in essence, the same applies to the universities. Universities become truly exceptional when they become dense, and when they allow for existence of a multi-layered public space where interaction between scholars, visitors, and general public is the driving force. And all of that contributes also to the presence of the university in the city. Currently, the first episode stops here, uh, when in 2014, the Austrian government uh, seized this project as part of the savings measures during the HIPPO bank bailout. 
So we had parrots, they had hippo. Which brings us to episode number two. Building as an extraordinary condition. And it brings us to Belgrade, to the Center for Promotion of Science. And this is a remarkable project because uh, the Center for Promotion of Science came as part of uh, gradual West-oriented uh, political reforms in Serbia. And promotion of science was a strategy done on a state level. A example of Serbia, uh, they realized they have no significant uh, natural resources, no access to the sea, but they have amazing, strong tradition in science. We all know Nikola Tesla, Pupin. Therefore, in the, in the, in the brief, uh, they listed the, the center of science as, as the top priorities, uh, one of the top priorities for an entire state. And I, I quote, uh, science centers inspire curiosity and support learning about sciences from early ages. In the area of knowledge-based societies, a modern science center can play a central role in dissemination of specific culture and strengthening of research, not only for young generations, but also for adults. And the site was chosen in uh, New Belgrade. And New Belgrade was originally designed in the 1950s as the connective part between two cities. Belgrade uh, the east and Zemun to the west. And by finding a way uh, of tying these two cities together with the new uh, modern housing district, Tito's regime intended to show a direction towards an emerging, emerging progressive nation. So at that time, the futuristic urban planning was carried out uh, with clear orthogonal street systems, wide boulevards, uh, fast traffic, open blocks uh, with appropriate content and lots of green zone with lots of environmental qualities. So the city is essentially, it's a, truly a city of our times, uh, of recent past, um, with a clear modernist perspective. And now, 60 years later, we wanted to understand how we read into new Belgrade and how we want to continue its construction. So we decided on very few simple spatial tools uh, that follow the, the principles of modernism. And firstly, we wanted to ele elevate the entire uh, campus city above the ground. Only pillars and elements of circulation shall touch on the ground. This would allow a lot of space um, usable for everybody. Uh, they do not block vision or movement. The terrain would be occupied by multitude of different vegetations, uh, bike routes and jogging paths. So the phasing of the master plan intended that uh, in the beginning uh, it would be the center for promotion of science uh, and the Science Institute tower uh, to, next to it. And this is interesting because um, it's, it, they proposed a business incubator for private companies developing scientific products, research and experimentation side by side um, to the center of uh, promotion of science and only then uh, growing around uh, this core would be uh, all the faculties for electrical engineering, sciences, mathematics. And really the question is, how does one promote something? And I think the answer is, uh, unless you have an enormous sign and advertising time, you try to offer something exceptional, something extraordinary. So the, our proposal was that the Center for Promotion of Science would float high above the ground and operate on three levels. First, on the level of entire city of Belgrade as an optimistic sign on one of its main routes. Secondly, as a sign, canopy and portico to enter the campus. And thirdly, a building that is envisioned and programmed to promote science and displays and plays on various visions of technology and construction. 
So the, the language of uh, architecture is strongly one that is expressing the structural principles. It is supported only on four uh, tripods, having a very robust, uh, highly flexible exhibition space. And on the exterior, you read exactly what it is. You read the hemisphere, the planetarium, the conference center, and the main exhibition hall. At the same time, with these simple ingredients, it becomes a very special building, really able to transform the entire city almost as a scientific miracle, uh, a special condition, challenging the laws of uh, physics and trying to act against gravity. So, from the underside of the center, uh, you are able to enter and go up into this darker, uh, space containing the planetarium above and the exhibition hall having views all over uh, New Belgrade. So the second episode is uh, to be continued because uh, state projects on such a scale uh, require not only strong project management but a very strong political leadership. And failure of, of such a leadership can be deadly for them. And in fact, we are standing here uh, in a, one project just like that, uh, this, this very moment. So, we are currently working with the fifth uh, government of Serbia since winning the competition. And uh, the loan of European Bank of Development is still available. The design is 97% complete, so we are enthusiastic and full of hope. So, the last Episode number three, uh, the library beyond the book. And what I mean uh, by that is everything uh, which allows the book to be activated. In fact, it's basically compass behind the book. And here there's quite a lot of books. It's a mountain of 100,000 volumes uh, for Cornell University of Fine Arts uh, Library in Ithaca, New York. And this finally looks a lot more like part Dalgava here. Uh, only it's not Dalgava River, but Cayuga Lake. And uh, something has to be said about uh, universities in the States. It's really something else. They're not bound to the state. They're not bound to public money. In fact, they're acting as private corporations driven by multiple boards of members. So, Cornell campus uh, has evolved over time as a real collection of jewels as the university can invite whom they like, organize international competitions and continue its development. You can see here, uh, it's the north end of the arts quad with some remarkable buildings. Johnson's Museum at the far end, designed by I.M. Pei. Uh, you have Sibley Dome, uh, you have the recently finished uh, Milstein Hall Studios by OMA, uh, and this is our project site here, right in front, uh, the Rand Hall from the end of um, uh, 20th century. So, the Art Squad, uh, I think it's really remarkable uh, move to, to place the Milstein Hall right in front of it, because uh, it also relates to some of the ideas um, that we wanted to bring into life in Vienna campus, because uh, OMA also found uh, a, a cluster which consists of fragmented buildings, and they tried to change this uh, nature of the linear campus by creating one central new space that destroyed these boundaries. And the uh, interesting fact is that the library was supposed to be in that building, as you can see. But uh, from the monument preservation uh, point of view, the columns that were carrying the loads of the books were too close to a listed building here on the right-hand side, so a 15-meter cantilever was produced, and uh, for budget reasons, the library had to move in the Rand Hall. And as you can see in this section, uh, 
the studios, the horizontal slab is directly attached to the building and it's an extremely dense setting. You have auditorium below and workshop below directly the fine arts library. Uh, I, <laughs> I have something on my screen here, but uh, I will run through shortly. Maybe, maybe this can be taken away, the, the red thing. <laughs> okay, so in the beginning when we saw how little space there was, uh, we even proposed uh, to, to have a library without books, to embrace all the digital tools. But the Cornell uh, librarians were very firm. They said, we know in 20 years probably no one will have books in their libraries, but we will. Um, and the direct uh, relation to the original materials in their eyes is simply invaluable. So they wanted to bring back books that they now keep in the cold storage uh, into the central campus and make them available for all the students. So we started to look at many high-density examples from Imperial Library of Vienna um, to A.D. White Room uh, and uh, very interesting University uh, of Cincinnati, I think, no, Public Library of Cincinnati, but unfortunately it's destroyed. But we came across uh, Cornell University uh, storage facility, which actually had shelves full of books and floors just supported by those shelves. Extremely dense environment that is governed only by the scale of the book. And this is what we tried to do. We tried to compress all this immense volume in the limited space, leaving only the reading and working areas uh, around. Essentially, it's an adaptive uh, reuse of existing structures. Uh, and remember, the workshop is still downstairs. So as, as a kind of X-ray view of the building, you have the shelves two winding staircases cutting through the shelves, more shelves, the new roof structure uh, that is allowing the construction, the structural base, new elevator and some existing functions, all cutting through the roof and covered by a new lantern. So change is an in inevitable part of uh, bodily functions of a university, but perhaps it's possible to give a hundred-year-old structures another hundred years. Three distinct volumes in a very dense setting. So the collection has arrived from the cold storage and is present and available for the patrons. Um, and uh, all of this is enhancing what they, what they want to uh, achieve with browsing. Browsing is, is a principle where you are looking for something and on your way there uh, you find lots of other things that can influence you. Just a very quick look at uh, personal study. This is Jerome in his st studio. Uh, from 1474, translating the Bible into Latin. And we tried to invent a new uh, working spot where physical material can be in direct touch with digital material. These are then these vertical book slabs going through the space. And I think in order to deal with the existing structures in a productive way, uh, a certain amount of fearlessness is required. And I hope that uh, in these three episodes, um, I managed to give a brief insight how universities can be test beds of ideas and perhaps the last fortresses of uh, limitless architectural innovation. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>